Thank you for, for the organization, Jens, and thank you, Karim, for the very kind invitation. I had uh, lots of uh, joyful, interesting, enlightening days already here. Um, I'd like to start with a question. Namely, is there a square root of minus one? So back in the old days, the answer would have been simple, right? The answer would have been, of course, there's no square root of minus one. When you square a number, the result will be non-negative. Hence, negative numbers don't have square roots. Okay. But also, already in the old days, square roots of negative numbers would have been useful. For instance, if you use uh, Cardano's formula for solving cubic equations, then square roots of negative numbers pop up even for, at the end, all the solutions of your cubic equations are real. In this sense, the square root of minus one and also the other complex numbers are mathematical phantoms, which trick mathematicians into accepting, into accepting them. Um, with the terminology of mathematical phantoms, I'm following Gavin Wraith, a well-known topos theorist, who states on his website, one of the recurring themes of mathematics, and one that I have always found seductive, is that of the non-existent entity which ought to be there, but apparently is not, which nevertheless obtrudes its effect so convincingly that one is forced to concede a broader notion of existence. So the square root of minus one promised so many applications that mathematicians broadened the, uh, the whole horizon of existence, the existence, the notion of existence, and nowadays complex numbers are just st uh, part of the standard undergraduate university curriculum. The square root of minus one is not the only phantom in the history of mathematics. There are lots of others. And that talk today will be about specific such phantom, a phantom which has not yet arrived like in the undergraduate textbooks, but perhaps that might change. Uh, today's talk is about the generic prime idea of a given commutative ring. And the remaining talk will be structured as follows. Firstly, I'd like to build some intuition about what that generic prime idea of a given ring should be. Then we will try to help that generic prime idea come into existence. And lastly, we will have a look at a couple of applications unlocked by that generic prime idea. Feel free to interrupt me at any point. Don't save your questions till the end, especially if you're like an undergraduate state uh, student, please don't uh, wait till the end. Just ask really any questions as soon as they arise. Any questions right now? Okay, then let's start with that picture. Perhaps you know the textbook by Miles Reed on um, community algebra, that's the frontispiece of that book, explaining the geometric picture, how to make sense of a community ring and a module over it. So let A be a community ring with a unit, and let M be an A module. Then recall, for any prime ideal P, we can form the stalk of M at P. That's a certain localization of the module, consisting of formal fractions x over s, where x is an arbitrary element of the module, and s is an element, depending on whether you followed me or the slides of p or of the complement of p. These things are called the stalks of m. For technical reasons, which will come clear later, um, I'm preferring to speak of prime filters instead of prime ideals. All of you know the term prime ideal, I guess. Okay. A prime filter is ex exactly the same, only that it's the complement. So you, you can obtain a prime filter from a prime ideal by taking the complement and vice versa. You already see like just a tiny advantage of speaking about prime filters instead of prime ideals. Namely here in the definition of the stalk, I don't, I don't then don't need to take the complement here because I already did it, like incorporated into it, into the definition. Okay, and uh, yeah, that, uh, that is a very useful definition because it turns out that it's prudent to think about modules, 
by their collection of this of each individual stalk. And this is what's indicated in the diagram on the right. On the base, you have the ring pictured by drawing each prime ideal, prime filter of the ring. Doesn't matter, they are exactly as many. And then above each prime filter, you uh, draw the corresponding um, corresponding stock. And the, um, the central motto of the generic prime filter is that in a certain sense, to a first approximation, the generic prime filter is a reification of all the individual prime filters into one single coherent entity. And I think that's best explained using a variant of the local global principle you might be familiar with. That's the ordinary local global principle from commutative algebra. This principle is the yeah, formal justification for drawing a module as the collection of its stocks. For instance, the module M is the trivial module if and only if all of the stocks vanish. Or a linear map between two A modules is injective if and only if it's stalk-wise injective. The same with surjective. And then you have a couple further examples. There's a small asterisk there because the direction from right to left um, goes beyond a certain minimal core of mathematical reasoning. The direction from right to left requires the axiom of choice, or more precisely, a smaller version of it, the so-called Boolean prime ideal theorem. And not for fun, but because I'm forced to, I like to think about the foundations of my results. And therefore, there's that small asterisk. You will see in a couple of moments why I need to be interested in foundations, why I need to be interested in foundational axioms. OK, so that is um, what you learn in any undergraduate course on commutative algebra. Now, let me show you uh, the modi modified version of the local global principle employing the generic prime filter instead of yeah, the ordinary prime filters. Look like that. So in the place where before we wrote for all prime filters P, we will now simply say, let's have a look at that individual single stalk, the stalk at the generic prime filter. I'm not yet telling you the official definition of what, a generic, what the generic prime filter is. That is for building intuition. M is zero if and only if its stalk at the generic prime filter vanishes. A linear map between modules is injective or surjective if and only if the induced map between the stalks at the generic prime filter is injective or surjective. That as a first glimpse of what I mean by generic prime idea. From the first three lines, you might get the impression that the generic prime idea is simply a shorthand, a linguistic abbreviation, a linguistic device for not writing down for every prime filter P, right? Because that has been the difference. First three lines, the right. But, all, but notice that the generic prime filter is more than that. And you will notice that when having a look at the bottom two lines. So if you know that all the individual stalks are finitely generated, this is not enough to conclude that the module is finitely generated. Similarly, if, if you know that all the individual stalks are finite free, each have a finite basis, this is not enough to conclude that the module itself is free. Let's have a look what happens here. Yeah, if the stalk at the generic prime ideal is finally generated, then indeed the module is se itself is finally generated. And if the stalk at the generic prime filter is finite free, then M is not, uh, then, then M is not finite free as well, but M is finite locally free. So, so there's a partition of unity 
such that when we uh, uh, localize away from each summand of that partition of unity, the module turns into a free module. So the generic prime filter is more than just an abbreviation, a shorthand for all the prime ideals. If something holds for the generic, for the stock, the generic prime filter, that's, that's of a deeper quality than simply that property holding individually, independently of each other, each ordinary stock. On the next slide, I'd like to show you um, yeah, a situation where you might have encountered the generic prime ideal already, or where you might have hoped for its existence. Do you have any questions, remarks, comments right now? Okay. As before, A is a community ring with the unit. Recall the stalks at prime filters are local rings. They are rings having exactly one prime idea, or equivalently having exactly one prime filter, or put in elementary terms, if a finite sum of elements is invertible, then at least one of the summons is invertible as well. That's a first order characterization of a local ring. Local rings uh, are a nice intermediate step between general rings and fields. And therefore, what you might wonder whether there's a universal way of turning any given ring A into a local ring. By that, I would mean, given a community of ring A with unit, is there a local ring A prime together with a ring homomorphism such that for any ring homomorphism into some other local ring R, that ring homomorphism F factors uniquely via a local homomorphism of rings as indicated in the diagram. A homomorphism of rings is called local if and only if it reflects invertibility. Any ring homomorphism preserves invertibility and if it also reflects it, then the ring homomorphism, homomorphism is called local. So that would be a sensible universal property for the universal localization of, of a ring. Let's ponder that problem for a second and see how, whether we could solve it. And um, to, as a first step, I propose that um, we fix a specific local ring R and see whether we can deduce any information about how A prime should look like so that it works at least for that specific local ring R. Because R is local, it has exactly one prime idea, also as it has exactly one prime filter, namely the prime filter of units. And hence we can um, take the pre-image of the filter of units. The pre-image of the filter of units will then be some prime filter of A. And hence, we can compute the stalk of A at that specific prime filter. And by the universal property of ordinary localization, we will then obtain a map like that. Because all the elements of the, in the denominators of elements in A prime get mapped by F to units. So that is our first candidate for A prime. But you also see that, like, th that we have not yet solved the universal problem completely, because this construction of A prime depends on the particular map into the particular local ring R. In, that's not the, the correct solution. Instead, what we, what we were asked to do is find a single ring A prime, which would then work for any local ring and any map into any local ring. We did it the other way around. We found for any map into a local ring, and a, a ring A prime, which would do the job for that. If you think a little bit more about that, you might notice that you are running out of ideas. And when that happens, it's good to like take a step back and um, think again about the problem, especially about whether it's solvable at all. And then you will notice, unfortunately, uh, that problem is almost never solvable. There's the following fact 
a universal localization in that sense exists if and only if A has exactly one prime filter, in which, in which case A is already a local ring, so that you are not interested in the universal localization of it. But if there was a prime filter which could somehow shift shape, which could somehow turn into any specific prime filter later on, then we could write down a positive solution to the problem. Namely, then we could take the stalk at the generic prime filter, at that specific, at that, that special prime filter. So by um, accepting the existence of the generic prime filter, we also get as a present the universal localization. Okay. Just as a first idea of what you can do with the generic prime filter. On the next slide, um, I'd like to start with a program of um, bringing the generic prime filter into existence. And for that, I think it's a good idea to start with um, elaborating what precisely we mean by generic in that context. Questions right now? Okay. Up to now, we have been talking about the generic prime filter. This is a particular instance of a more general notion, the notion of generic models. There's not only the generic prime filter of a given ring A, there's also the generic prime filter of some other ring B. And perhaps more interestingly, there's also the generic ring or the generic group or the generic interval or the generic map. There are very few restrictions on what you uh, may put after the word generic in order so that everything works as um, intended in that talk. And I think the best way to explain in which sense genericity holds is by having a look at the generic ring. And that is what we will do on the next slide. So, theorem. The, there is a generic ring. That is a particular ring such that for every ring theoretic statement, the following are equivalent. That statement holds for the generic ring, it holds for every ring, and it's provable from the ring axioms. So what the theorem is stating is that the generic ring has exactly those properties which are shared by all rings whatsoever. And that makes it a, a very particular, very interesting, very special ring. And that makes it unlike any other ring you have previously encountered. Because any other ring you have previously encountered had some special features to that particular ring, which were not shared by all the other rings in existence. Do not confuse the generic ring, for instance, with the ring of integers, with that. The integers are also an important ring. They are the initial ring, they are the initial object in the category of rings. But they are not generic in that sense. For instance, in the integers, it holds true that one plus one is not equal to zero, but equal to two. But that does not hold true in all rings. Also, the polynomial ring over Z, while also very important, being the free ring on one generator, also that ring is not the generic ring for exactly the same reason. So the generic ring is really a new kind of thing. You might have reservations about um, that generic ring and about that generic business, not least because I still did not give any like formal precise details. Um, I'd like to resolve that, those reservations on beginning with the next slide. But right now I'd like to deepen them first by raising the following question. Is one plus one equal zero in the generic ring? That can't be true, because in, if in the generic ring, one plus one equal, would equal zero, then that would be the case for all rings. And there are a couple of rings in which that's false. But also, this cannot be false, 
because if one plus one was not equal to zero in the generic ring, then the same would be, the, then that would also not be the case in any ring whatsoever. But there are rings which have characteristic two. So that seems to be a bizarre situation because a universal, a very basic law of logic, the law of the middle, calcium mandator, states that any mathematical statement is true or not true. And this seems to be a counterexample. The resol resolution to the paradox is the following. The generic ring is a ring, but it's not a ring in the same mathematical universe we are usually working in. It turns out, we will um, talk about that on the next slide in more detail, that there's not only one mathematical universe, but there's a whole host of, uh, there's a whole host of universes together constituting the mathematical multiverse. And while the generic ring is a ring, it does not exist in the standard universe. We need to enlarge our universe in order to find it. Exactly as we need to enlarge the real line to the complex plane in order to find the imaginary unit. In view that one plus one is neither the zero nor not zero for the generic ring, you might um, yeah, get a little bit scared and, and, um, might, and you might be wondering, what about all those other results in ring theory vastly surpassing that trivial statement that one plus one is equal to zero or is not equal to zero that you've learned about? Or can I, do I need to forget all of these ring theoretic results for the generic ring? The answer is luckily not at all, uh, because most axioms of mathematics also hold true in that alternate universe. There's only, there are only two axioms which are sometimes used in mathematics which do not hold true. One is the law of the middle and one the other is the axiom of choice. All the other axioms of logic, of set theory and so on also hold in those alternate universes, especially in that alternate universe in which the generic ring is located. And hence, you can apply most of your knowledge about rings also to the generic. There's a further fine print there at the word every. Um, I'd like to um, yeah, deepen your resistance with the following example. The generic ring is a field. Okay, now I need to resolve a contradiction, right? Because obviously not every ring is a field, but the theorem states that for every ring theoretic statement, the following equivalent, the generic ring has it or all rings has it. The solution out of that paradox is that fine print at the word every, namely the theorem does not actually apply to every ring theoretic statement, but only to those ring theoretic statements which are of a special syntactic form called geometric implications. Here's what a geometric implication looks like. A geometric implication may start with an arbitrary string of universal quantifiers. And then there may be an implication sign. And here and there, there might be further formulas, but you are not allowed to write down anything what you want. You are you're only allowed to use the following ingredients, equality, conjunction, disjunction, in, in a disjunction over a family of, of things, existential quantification, and just for completeness, um, bottom. Bottom is the, the formal way of writing the contradiction symbol in mathematics. And also top, the dual of bottom, the formal way of writing one equals one in mathematical logic. These are all allowed there, and not allowed are all the remaining logical symbols. So you may not use not, you may not use implication, and you may not use universal quantifier. Okay, and the um, generic ring is a field in the following sense. For all x in the generic ring, 
if the assumption that x is zero yields the absurd result that one equals zero, then x is invertible. If x is not zero, then x is invertible. The generic ring is a field in this particular sense, but as you see, this is not a geometric implication because of that nested implication here. And hence, it does not pass from the generic ring to all rings whatsoever. That way we have averted that paradox. Yeah. So is the field not a generic field or is that something? Not a geometric field. Okay. Because there, um, what's a geometric field? A geometric field is a field, is a ring which satisfies the following condition. Any element is zero or invertible. That's a geometric field. Um, it's called that way because this is a geometric implication. Right now, it doesn't look like it, but it will in a couple of seconds. Now it looks like a geometric implication. Okay. And the generic ring is not a field in that sense, only a field in that weaker sense below. You might be wondering why I have shown you that particular example. I've shown you that because it already gives rise to a first application of that concept of generic models. Namely, that, that box here gives rise to the following application. When you do some proof about rings, when you want to show a very general statement for all rings, then under certain circumstances, you may assume without loss of generality that you're working with fields with fields in the sense below. Those special circumstances are exactly those where the claim you want to verify happens to be a geometric implication. Because if your goal is to verify that a certain geometric implication holds for all rings, then by the theorem, you might just as well just verify it for the generic ring. But the generic ring just so happens to be a field in that sense. And hence, without loss of generality, you may assume the field condition. For that without loss of generality, it's important that the claim you want to verify is a geometric implication. Because else, you will not be able to walk along that bridge made by the theorem, passing from the generic ring to all rings whatsoever. But that is also the only thing you need to take attention of especially as part of, of a longer proof, you may encounter and you may use lots of statements which are not geometric implications. The restriction is only on the form of the claim, not on the form of all the intermediate subclaims appearing somewhere in the proof. So that is already a nice, nice thing. It's, it's not like uh, fields metal worthy. Yeah? Um, but it is a nice thing. Uh, Anders Koch has used it in the 70s or 80s uh, in order to generalize a couple of results from linear algebra to from fields to local rings. Um, in particular, he, he developed basics of projective linear algebra over or projective geometry over local rings. Yeah? And for that, he used exactly that method here. Hmm. Yeah, very good question. The question is, does the generic ring have a characteristic? The answer is yes, but the uh, characteristic is not a natural number. It cannot be a specific natural number because any specific answer would be false. But still, the characteristic exists in a more general sense. Um, the, and I can quickly explain the reason. How do you define the characteristic uh, ordinarily? Well, you say it's the minimal natural number n such that 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 0 n times. For this definition to be well defined, um, you are implicitly using a lemma, namely that any inhabited set of natural numbers has a minimal element. Turns out that this lemma is not available in that alternative universe in which the generic ring is located. 
because that lemma is in fact equivalent to the law of excludal middle. And we don't have that in that universe. But just like the rationals are not complete, you can, and you still can complete them to obtain the reals, we can also complete the natural numbers line so that after completion, it is closed undertaking minima. The result will be yeah, a set of completed natural numbers. It doesn't have an, uh, a name in ordinary mathematical practice because ordinarily you would never bother of completing the natural numbers because assuming the logs rule middle, they are, are already complete in that sense. Okay. But still, you have it. And then the characteristic of a ring, for instance, of the generic ring, is a member of that completed natural numbers line. And what about the statement that for every ring there exists a ring morphism from that to the ring so that it also holds for the generic ring? The question of the third of uh, Yeah. <laughs> Um, so firstly, yeah, it holds also for the generic ring. Almost everything in ring theory also holds for the generic ring. Yeah? So in particular that fact. Yeah, and the kernel will be a certain idea, um, but it will not be the idea generated by two, and it will also not be the idea generated by three. It will also not be the zero idea, but still it will be an idea. It will be ju just like the generic prime filter or the generic ring is in some sense hard to, hard to pinpoint, hard to grasp. Also that kernel will be hard to pinpoint, hard to grasp, but still it will exist and the homomorphism theorem will work and everything you expect with ideals will work with that as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> For every element, if assuming that X is zero yields that absurd statement, then X is invertible. If you don't have the law of excluded middle available, then these two ring, uh, these two field axioms are not equivalent. And then the top one is stronger than the bottom one. Um, but luckily, even the weak one often uh, is enough for carrying out certain proofs, which is why that um, observation by Anders Koch um, does have some uses. Yeah. Uh, what is then the logic that to make this more bigger universe? Mm -hmm. It's, um, if you want, it's um, predicate logic, but it's an intuitionistic version of predicate logic. Um, in fact, it's an, a higher order version of an intuitionistic version of predicate logic. So you can form inside that alternate universe power sets and function spaces and so on. And if you want to, you can even interpret um, a, specific for, a specific form of, of type theory in there. Uh, so really, um, unless you are a set theorist by trade, you can do anything you ever did with mathematical objects in those alternative universes as well, as long as you are taking care not to use the extreme choice and not to use the law. So the continuum hypothesis of sets is similar. Uh, is similarly undecided as in the standard universe. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit like, I mean, like the models in the topoi. Yeah. So, do, are there like any um, say specific topoi in where you have like uh, an example of the generic ring already yeah. constructed? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, uh, so, firstly, toposes will appear on the next slide yeah, so that everyone can chime in, even those who do not yet know the term topos. Secondly, it's possible to explicitly write down the topos in which the generic ring lives in. And it's also possible to explicitly write down the generic ring. Also oh, yeah, so very explicit. No, yeah. The generic ring lives in one particular topos, custom tailored to um, so that the generic ring can live in, inside it. And 
the, the minimal moment of it, so some category of models, and it's well, by construction almost always like the initial object. But, but now you said that it's not um, right. The, the, yeah. The yeah. The generic ring is related with like initial objects. Or the generic model and more general models are related to initial models, but they are distinct. They're not the same. Yeah. Karim? One and a half questions relating to two and three. Yeah. Three is the, the, the provable, probably that means also provable without using axiom of choice or law of exclusion. Or it doesn't matter for those. So, but I can understand it. If you want to, yeah, but um, uh, there's a meta theorem in mathematical logic called Barr's theorem, which states that a geometric implication, so a statement of that specific form, is provable with the axiom of choice and with the law of the middle, if and only if it's provable without those two axioms. So for those, there is no difference. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's not surprising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. theorem, yeah. Uh, so would it just two to three also follow from mm -hmm. uh, standards? Yeah. Uh, two to three, I looked it up. Two to, th two to three also follows from standard results in logic, <coughs> namely um, Gödel completeness. But um, uh, for general Gödel completeness, you again need that Boolean prime ideal theorem, that slight weakening of the axiom of choice. And um, for geometric implications, that equivalence holds without any uh, non-constructed axioms. So it means that it is fixed, uh, because if you restrict to construct uh, to geometric statements, it is a bit more restricted. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's a more more narrow claim, but on the other hand, it requires less assumptions on the meta theory. Now it's a constructive result. Before uh, it wasn't. Yeah. Is there some sort of? So I guess if the generic model fully depends on what statements you allow to transfer and not. <coughs> I, so I can imagine if you allow some different sets, maybe so yeah. depending on the switching of quantifier or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's you have different mm -hmm. notion of generic. Yeah. So first, you need to fix a theory, a geometric theory, for instance, the theory of rings or fields or prime ideals, and then you will obtain the generic model of that specific theory. For the center. Well, you will obtain that model, and then you can start um, studying that model, and then by chance stumble upon that field property, for instance. But the model is fixed. No, but I mean, the, the, the statement is that this is generic for sentences of these shapes, the geometric shape. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So is that in turn, that is no. something you choose? Or in advance to some extent of these sort of yeah. sentences I want I want to be able to live. Yeah, the, all all the geometric implications. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I don't need like to, to individually handpick like five of them and then get a model which lifts those, but no, but if you would yeah. have chosen to call, for example, and just make up a name like quadratic yeah. statements. Yeah. And I want to find the generic model for all good that lifts all yeah. statements that are quadratic. Okay, yeah. You get a different generic model. Yeah. And, and in fact, that machinery which I'm introducing here to you only works for geometric implications. Right. That's really a hard restriction. Okay. So topuses. Um Topos is the uh, proper technical name for alternate mathematical universe. Um, if you have never heard of the word topos, uh, then don't worry. You still have work inside a specific topos, namely the so-called standard topos set. The topos is a certain kind of category, and the standard topos is the category of sets. And within this category of sets, the usual laws of logic hold. But besides the standard topos, there's a host of alternative toposes. And in one of those, the generic ring is. 
and in a further one, the generic prime ideals, and so on. Um, but uh, all those topuses support mathematical reasoning, but only the intuitionistic part of it. So the common denominator of all topuses is constructive mathematics. So mathematics without the law of the dual middle, without um, the law of double negation elimination. In fact, these two are equivalent to each other and without the axiom of choice. But as long as you're not using any of these, you're fine. Um, on the right hand side, you see one of my favorite topuses, even though it um, doesn't have a, a close relationship to the generic prime idea. It's the so-called effective topos, which is particularly nice for uh, computer scientists because the effective topos is made up using data types. And all the morphisms in the effective topos are computable maps by definition. We will um, explore the effective topos in more detail on the next slide. Just um, before continuing, I'd like to yeah, introduce this bit of uh, notation to you. When we say that some statement phi holds in the internal universe of a given topos E, then we are writing that as follows. And there's um, a short and clear and simple um, definition of, of how to compute with that symbol, how to determine whether a statement phi holds in eternally to any topos E. In the special case that E is the topos set, we could just omit those two signs because the statement phi holds in set if and only if it just holds. Yeah? So this notation is only important when you start uh, working in other topuses than the standard topos. And here's the meta theorem, which um, is the main model theorem allowing you to actually pretend that you can work in topuses, that you can go there yeah, and do mathematics uh, because you can reason inside topuses. If by whatever circumstances um, you learn that some statement phi holds in a topos E, and if you know that phi entails some further statement psi, then you may deduce that psi also holds in E. Hence, the objects of topuses are amenable to mathematical reasoning just as ordinary mathematical objects are. And therefore, like when you are dealing with topuses, um, the objects of topuses will, uh, will, will come to life in your mind, just like ordinary mathematical objects come to life in your mind, even if perhaps you are actually like a formalist and believe that, um, that prime numbers don't exist and that numbers don't exist, that everything's still only a play with symbols on a piece of paper, but still it, it, they feel real because mathematical reasoning applies to them. Okay, so let's um, explore couple of examples in the effective topos just so that you get a gist of how different toposes can be. Here's a list of five statements. And then also an indication whether they hold true or whether they don't hold true. Yeah. Statements that should be built up in the language yeah. is somehow already depending on the topos. So. Right. And in order to make that a fair comparison, I chose to use only the common part of the language of the topos set and the language of the topos F. And as you see, in fact, I cheated because all those statements are put in English language and not like in formal logical language with lots of symbols but it's like an exercise to the reader uh, to translate all those English language sentences into uh, sentences of the appropriate topos language. Here's the first example. Every natural number is prime or not prime. In the topos of set, this is not only true, but trivially true. You don't need to even know what the definition of a prime number is and can still conclude that this statement is true. In the effective topos, it's also true, but it's not trivially true because the meaning of the first statement in the effective topos is not 
that it's true that there's a natural that every natural number is prime or not prime, but that this fact has a computable witness. That means that there's a Turing machine, an idealized computer program, a computer program running on a machine which can never break and which has arbitrary resources. There's a Turing machine which determines of any given number whether it's prime or not. That is a programming task. It's a solvable programming task. Often when you learn programming, that's one of the first exercises you do. And that is the reason why that statement holds true in the effective purpose. There are infinitely many primes. This is true in the standard topos, not trivially true, but true by Euclid's theorem. And it's also true in the effective topos because that statement has a computable witness, namely a Turing machine which is able of producing more and more prime numbers. Next example. Every map from n to n is constantly zero or not. Again, trivially true in the standard topos because it's just an instance of the law of excluding middle. It's not true in the effective topos. Because interpreting that statement in the effective topos um, amounts to the following statement. There's a machine which, given a machine computing a map from n to n, determines whether that map f is constantly zero or not. And this is something which you as a machine cannot do. When, if, when you are given that machine computing f, you can simulate that machine on arbitrary inputs. And thereby, you can learn about the value of f of 0 and f of 1 and f of 2. And perhaps when enumerating the values of the function, you will encounter a non-zero value. Then you are justified in concluding that the map is not 0. But if all the function values you have encountered so far are 0, you're not justified in concluding that it's the constant 0 function. It might just also be the case that in that finite range you explored up to so far, there have been no non-zero function values, and later on there will be. So as an ordinary Turing machine, um, you cannot find out whether a, a given map, a given computable map is constant, constantly zero or not. And that's the reason why this statement does not hold true in the effective purpose. Yeah? Um, so you said that the Turing machine had like, um, not infinite resources, but like um, arbitrary resources. Arbitrary resources, yeah. But it cannot run for uh, for forever, right? Or um, uh, it can run forever, but in that case, it will never produce a result. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So no. Okay. But you are alluding to a very interesting point of view uh, uh, or point. Um, of course, logicians have not been content with uh, finite Turing machines. And therefore, they explored the concept of supercomputation or hypercomputation, uh, including as a special case, the concept of infinite time Turing machines. Ordinary Turing machines um, um, proceed in a, in a series of computational steps, and those computational steps can be enumerated using the natural numbers. Step number zero, step number one, two, three. Infinite time Turing machines can be enumerated using the ordinary numbers. So the time steps of infinite time Turing machines can be computed uh, enumerated within the ordinal numbers. So an infinite time Turing machine can work forever and then continue working. And in fact, you can also build the effective topos not using Turing machines, but using infinite time Turing machines. And then that statement will be true again, because an infinite time Turing machine does not have any problems enumerating all the function values. And then after that, having a look whether there was a non-zero value and settling that question. Every map from n to n is computable. This statement is totally false in the standard topos because there are uncountably many maps from n to n, but only countably many Turing machines. Therefore, there have to be lots of maps from n to n which are not computable. In the effective topos, this statement is true, and it's not only true, but trivially true. I included that example so you don't get the impression that what's true in the effective topos is simply a subset of what's true in the standard topos. They are incomparable as the conjunction of these examples shows. It's trivially true because what it actually means is 
that there's a machine which, given a machine computing a map f from n to n, outputs a machine computing that map. That's the meaning of that statement. And there's a trivial machine um, which is up to the task, namely the machine which simply echoes the input back to the output. Yeah? Okay, so that was just a glimpse of um, how different those toposes can be. But there are also upper limits to how different can, they can be because mathematical reasoning, except from the law of the luminal index of choice, still applies in any topos. Yeah, so um, still there are infinitely many primes and still, um, if you have two bases of a vector space, they have the same length and uh, the angle sum in a triangle is always 180 degrees and so on. Yeah, Most of the knowledge you already have about mathematics applies equally well in any topics. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Yeah, at the moment. sure. Um, well, because limit is from, well, the Yeah. So yeah. I would assume that in that I mean for certain sense for time theory that you yeah. can script yeah. through. Yeah. 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 But on the on the other hand, then you also say that like this um yeah, you just use like a Turing machine which can compute. Um, I don't see how that comes into play. Is why I, I don't know what the effect is uh, the effect of the size mm -hmm. how it is constructed, but I just don't really see mm -hmm. how you can uh, yeah. take a connection between the two. Things. Yeah, I mean, I did not give the proper definition of the effective topos. I just tried uh, to show you by a couple of examples how to check whether a statement holds inside the effective topos, but without telling you the def definition of the effective topos. Therefore, firstly, I can relate um, to you, and secondly, um, uh, yeah, the, right now, the question does not really have an answer because I would need to properly define the effective topos. But maybe um, let's let's say at least the following. Um, so the effective topos can be written down just like any topos, or most toposes with a name can be written down. And um, a crucial ingredient uh, for in the definition of the effective topos is Turing machines. And by that way, somehow you obtain that link. And it's, it's a beautiful fact of life that constructive mathematics applies in the effective topos because it tells us that any theorem which has a constructive proof also has a computable witness because else it wouldn't, oh, wow, okay, now I've been using the law of in the matter of theory, I'm sorry. Um, because statements which are true in the effective topos have computable witnesses. Uh, constructive mathematics is, is more than just computable mathematics. Constructive mathematics is agnostic about whether some sometime later you will then take the, your proof and apply it internally to the effective topos, or whether you will apply it in the standard topos, or whether you apply it in some different topos. Yeah? It's agnostic, therefore it's more general, but it's intimately related to, to issues of computability, of course. Okay, in the uh, final couple minutes, let me return to the generic prime filter offering. So we learned that the generic prime filter exists, but not in the standard universe, but in some other topos. On the slide before, you learned by way of example, how to check whether statements hold true in the effective topos. Now I'd like to show you, and not only by way of example, but by a formal definition, how to check whether a statement holds true in the particular topos where the generic prime filter of a given ring A lives in. The so-called classifying topos of the theory of prime filters of A. For that, I'm defining, yeah, um, this this thing, capital D, that's just a symbol of 
then there's a ring element of A, then that funny sign symbol, and then a formula. Okay, and I'm defining that because of that result here, of the second result here, a formula holds in the classifying corpus of the theory of prime filters of A, if and only of if V of one forces phi. This is something you can um, check, assuming you had all the definitions of classifying corpus and so on, which you don't have. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, but, but yeah, but like this is what the internal language amounts to at the end. Um, and you see a couple of interesting features. Um, maybe the, a good one is to start with the first one. So when we are on stage F, on stage D of F, when we are saying that for all X's in A tilde phi of X holds, then what we actually mean is what's written on the right. We call A tilde, I did not draw attention to it, by A tilde, I mean the localization, the stalk of A at the generic prime filter. Okay. Okay, and uh, you see here the translation. And you see that um, we do not stay on that starting stage D of F, but instead we um, also consider arbitrary refinements to later stages, to smaller stages, to more localized parts of the ring. If and only if for all G in A and all elements in um, A, G of minus one, and I'm sorry, this should not be G, sorry, but it should be FG, okay? FG, just like it's here, FG for all x0 in the localized ring A away from Fg, that holds. And if phi itself is a longer, more convoluted statement, then we have to apply these translation rules again and thereby perhaps again pass to even smaller stages, to parts of the ring where we have localized even more. So at the end of the day, uh, when we talk about the generic prime filter, we are not actually talking about the generic prime filter, but because there is no generic prime filter in the standard corpus, in the standard universe. Instead, any talk about the generic prime filter is an abbreviation using these rules um, of some talk about the ring A and lots of its localizations, for instance, array from FG. And this aberration is made in such a manner that miraculously the laws of mathematical reasoning still apply. And let me conclude by, um, by an example. Illustrating the use of that language. Let M be a matrix that M be a matrix with more columns than rows. And assume that the linear map induced by the matrix is injective. That might already feel odd to you because you learned in undergraduate linear algebra that this situation over fields is not possible. And the same is true over rings. Yeah? In the sense of that there's just one ring over which such a situation is possible, namely the trivial ring in which one equals zero. And here's the standard textbook proof of that fact. Proof. Assume not. Assume that A is not the zero ring. In that case, it has an, a prime ideal. And then from that prime ideal, you can also obtain a minimal prime ideal using Zorn's lemma. You can then take the stalk of A at that specific prime ideal and uh, check again using Boolean prime ideal theorem that this is a field. The mark matrix you started with is also injective when considered as a matrix over a P because localization is exact. And hence you have reduced to the situation of undergraduate linear algebra where you are over vector space and hence you have the contradiction. Okay, that is a very nice, very short, very elegant proof, but it's also um, the opposite of being an explicit proof. It appeals to the transfinite three times 
even for the statement of the theorem is very simple and straightforward. You would expect that there's also a more concrete, more computational proof. And in fact, there is. If you unroll this proof employing the generic prime filter, M is injective also as a matrix over A tilde over the stock of A at the generic prime ideal because localization is exact. And the proof that localization is exact does not require the loss of include middle or the axiom of choice. Therefore, it also holds true in that alternative purpose. Okay. Then AP0 is a field. I did not mention that before, but it's true. The stalk at the generic prime ideal is always a field. And hence, you're already reduced to the uh, situation of undergraduate linear algebra. I see that this proof is, of course, right now also abstract, just that as that proves abstract, but here nowhere non-constructive axioms uh, enter through the back door. So it's possible to unroll this proof, unroll, unwind all the definitions, and then at the end you will end up with an actual concrete explicit proof. Let me show you the final example, Grotendieck's generic freeness theorem. This is a basic theorem in the theory of modular spaces in algebraic geometry. Um, it comes in lots of versions. Um, the basic version is that one. Um, and uh, the, the standard proofs of these uh, span like three textbook pages where they um, proceed in a series of reduction step, reducing first doing it for Noetherian integral domains and then dropping Noetherian and then dropping integral and so on. It's a complicated matter. Um, using the generic prime ideal or the generic prime filter, um, you can give a much, much shorter proof. Here's a statement. Let M be a finally generated A module. If F, if zero is the only element of A such that localizing, localizing away from that element turns M into a free module, then the ring is trivial. Usually it's, it's stated in contrapositive form. Usually they say, if the ring is not trivial, then there's a non-zero element such that when you localize away, M turns into a free module. Here's a quick proof. You observe, um, you observe that because you have played around with the generic prime filter for longer than this uh, talk, you observe that the statement you want to prove is exactly the meaning of the internal statement that M tilde is not not free. The statement that M tilde is free would amount to the statement that M is lo finite locally free. The statement that M tilde is not not free amounts to exactly that statement. Okay. Okay. And then you need to verify that statement. And it turns out that this statement is trivial. It follows from trivial undergraded linear algebra, or to be more honest, from trivial undergraded intuitionistic linear algebra. In, ordi in, the, in your ordinary linear algebra course, you learn that any finitely generated vector space as a basis. Constructively, that's not true for reasons related to the question from before, because we cannot take the minimal um, generating family. But still, it's true that, and you learn that in that hypothetical course on undergraduate interest in linear algebra, uh, uh, you learn that any finite generated vector space does not not have a basis. Similar as to that any inhabited set of natural numbers does not not have a minimal element. Yeah? That's exactly the lemma you need in order to do that linear algebra proof. Okay, and then you are done. And in order the whole process, you have not used loss, loss in the middle or x of choice once, and it's a very short proof. And if you want to, you can unwind it. In the process of unwinding, it gets longer again, of course, but not substantially so. Uh, if you unwind that, it will be like eight lines, nine lines, and then you have a nice short proof of putting the extreme Thank you very much for your attention.